Okay, so what I want to do today is we're going to finish up this teaching series we've been doing called Agree with God, Be Steadfast and Immovable. Okay, so I want to start off with this page. And this page we've looked at before, so this is a recap, but this is really what it's all about. Okay, so 2,000 years ago, you know, Jesus, and, and even before 2,000 years ago, so deposits were made into our heavenly bank account, and through faith, we can make withdrawals at any time from all the things that have been put into the bank account. Okay, so we have sufferings of Jesus that have led to benefits. We have promises of God that are in our bank account. We have all the full salvation of Jesus Christ has been put into our bank account. So all these things are sitting already in a bank account for Kyber, for Raul, for Karyana, for Bobby, for Kathy. For each of us, we've got a heavenly bank account that has everything already put into it. And we have all these past tense deposits that have been made. Um, so available right now to us. You know, the things that are already deposited into our bank account include health, healing, freedom from pain. You know, the stripes of Jesus paid for these things. Freedom from curse, freedom from wrath, freedom from law. Jesus redeemed us from these. It's available now. Provision, prosperity, victory in life, aid, assistance of God. That's in the bank account. That's part of our salvation. It's part of our full salvation. It's available right now. Um, perfect protection, preservation from all harm, preservation from all evil, preservation from plague, uh, all of that, it's in the bank account, available today. Physical salvation, you know, deliverance, rescue, um, so being rescued from any you know, dangerous event like a crash on the freeway, a plane crash, a bomb blowing up or whatever. So our physical salvation, our rescue, our deliverance, it is paid for, it's in the bank. And through faith, we can walk in that every day. A long, satisfying life, that's in our bank account. It's available for us to receive. Freedom from shame, freedom from punishment, freedom from sin, death, and sin nature, it's all in the bank. All authority in heaven and on earth so that we can walk in victory and defend ourselves and help people, it's in the bank. The Holy Spirit and the miraculous power of God, it's in the bank. And then... At some future point, uh, eternal life in paradise. It's in the bank. So all these things, they're, they're in the bank. That's It's available to us like right now. Okay, Today is the day of salvation. Right? That's what it says to us. And it tells us in 2 Peter 1, 2-4, I'll just read this real quick. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you and the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay, so all these things, you know, this passage tells us that all these wonderful things, everything pertaining to life, everything pertaining to godliness have past tense already been given and they've been given in the form of promises in the form of sufferings of Jesus and things like that so it's it's already available now okay and then we make a withdrawal we make a present tense withdrawal by faith like in 2 Corinthians 1 19 to 20 and in 1 John 5 14 to 15 the Bible tells us that we can pray for anything according to God's good will and the answer is yes that's in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And then likewise, it says the same thing about promises, which are just a subset of his goodwill. Like in 2 Corinthians 1, 19 to 20. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Okay, so we are promised that the answer to any promise of God, the answer to anything aligned with His goodwill, the answer is yes. Okay, well, how do we make that happen? Well, we make it happen by you know, speaking to the mountain and by being in faith. And as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, And when He had come into the house, the blind men came to Him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe? 
that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then Jesus touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. Okay? And so Jesus healed these men, um, and it was according to their faith. Okay, so we can have faith for ourselves, which is the primary thing we're pushing in this teaching, is to have faith for ourselves. Um, but we can also have faith for another person. And in this case, Jesus was saying that their blindness was healed because of their faith. And so we want to come to believe in everything that Jesus has put into our bank account. And then by faith, we can receive those things today. And so in order to, to do this, we need to be in faith. And there's three aspects to faith. Okay, we need to... You know, know about the promises of God, know the goodwill of God. We need to know the full salvation. We need to know what's in our bank account. So we need to believe what God has done for us. Okay, then the second part of being in faith, operating in faith, is to speak it. So we have to speak in agreement with God's goodwill. We have to speak in agreement with His promises. We have to pray for these things. We have to confess them with our mouth while believing in our heart. And whenever you can, whenever you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you've just operated in faith, and that thing will come forth. And then the another aspect is we also need to align our actions. We need our actions to be faith-filled actions and not contradictory actions. Okay. Sometimes people will say they believe something. Um, well, they, they they they're claiming with their mouth that they believe something, so they're speaking faith. They say they're believing in something, but yet their actions betray them, and their actions are actually in contradiction. So we need to make sure that our actions and our speech are aligned with what we say we're believing in. Okay, And then when we have all those things in alignment with God's goodwill, then we're truly operating in faith, and we will be receiving from God. Okay, Now, let's look at an example. So we need to change our attitude about God's goodwill. Like we need to get um, like practically violent about it. Like we need to so strongly believe it belongs to us that we're ready to fight about it. We're ready to almost get violent about it. Okay, so let me just give an example. We'll walk through a worldly example and then that's kind of the the vehemence that I want us to have about God's full salvation for each of us. Okay, so let's say that you received an inheritance of a million dollars which is in your personal bank account. You have all the evidence that proves this money is yours, such as a deposit slip and a bank statement. So one day, a crisis comes up and you urgently need a significant withdrawal immediately. You go to the bank to get some money and they tell you, I'm sorry, but you don't have any money deposited here. Okay, now you had a million dollars in your bank account and now somebody's trying to tell you you don't have any money in this bank. I mean, you are going to go postal. Okay, you would vehemently disagree with the lie or misunderstanding or whatever you want to call it. You would vehemently disagree with what they're telling you, and you would immediately get ferocious. Right? You would show proof from the deposit slips. You would show proof from the bank statements. You would escalate to bank managers. You would escalate to bank headquarters. You would get lawyers. You would get judges. You would get whatever you needed. You would fight and get that one million dollars that belongs to you. You wouldn't just like roll over and say, "Oh, I guess you're right. You know, I really didn't have a million dollars on deposit." Okay. No, you would be showing all the proof you have. Um, you may even be on the brink of violence to get your money. You know, I had a million dollars in this bank. You better give me my money. You know, people would go postal for that. Okay, you certainly will not bow down and agree that you don't have a million dollars on deposit at the bank. You will vehemently disagree and you will vehemently proclaim that you do have the money until they resolve the problem and the facts, your bank about your bank balance until and the facts change back to the truth that you were proclaiming and have evidence of. Okay? So now now think about that in terms of our bank statement with God. By his stripes you were healed. Okay, that's in the bank. That's in the bank. So some doctor comes along and says, you have cancer, you're going to die. Now you need to like just treat it like this million dollars in your bank account that they said you don't have. You, ha you would just violently disagree with that. You violently contest that. You force this bank 
in this worldly example, you would force that bank to to do the research, do whatever they need to do. You would force the issue until you got your money back. Okay, you would force it. You wouldn't quit. You wouldn't just agree with them and say, "I don't have a million dollars." You're right. Uh, oh, I guess I guess this deposit slip wasn't real. You, you would never say anything like that. But that's what Christians do all the time. They just back off of, by his stripes you were healed. Uh, I guess that really wasn't in the bank. I guess that really was not on deposit in the bank account. You know, so we need to realize that these things, they went into your bank account. By his stripes you were healed. So don't let somebody talk you out of that. Don't agree with the devil trying to say, no, you don't have health and healing in your bank account. You don't agree with that. You know, you vehemently fight it just like you'd fight for that million dollars because this belongs to you. You have a bank statement. You have a deposit slip. By his stripes, you were healed. He bore your sicknesses. He carried your pains. And by his stripes, you were healed. That is in the bank. And you need to fight for that. If the facts disagree with that, you fight for that. And the facts will rearrange. We don't accept anything less than that. Just like you wouldn't accept them negating your million dollars don't it don't allow your healing to be negated okay the same thing with um, fulfillment of needs yeah, there's scriptures that say um, and my God shall supply all of your need through his riches and glory by Christ Jesus but you know but some people will accept well I guess God just you know he's not going to cover this need you know they just back off of what's in the bank don't back off fight for it be vehement vehemently disagree with what the devil's saying and he, he's probably saying these things like through somebody you trust through a doctor through a lab report through through some some respectable source is usually the source of where you're getting your contradiction from okay it doesn't matter who it is God is superior to them and believe in his truth and the facts will rearrange to come into alignment with with his truth Okay, also in our bank account would be all the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. In our bank account, protection, no evil will befall you. In the bank account, you know, immunity from sickness, nor shall any plague come near you. Okay, in the bank account, long life, you know, with long life he will satisfy you and show you his salvation. Okay, so everything we just looked at on this page, all this stuff in this red box, that's in the bank here. And all that stuff, we need to like practically violently fight for it just as if we'd fight for this million dollars that the bank said we didn't have okay so in the exact same way that you would vehemently disagree with the million dollars disappearing you must vehemently disagree with Satan saying that you have a disease and you're going to die or that you're gonna fail at something you're doing in life or that things are gonna get worse or whatever he's saying to you that contradicts a promise of God the promise of God is your bank statement and you never want to back off of that it belongs to you it's in your bank so we never let anybody back us off of that we have to be adamant and vehement and ferocious about it we must vehemently disagree with Satan always regardless of whether or not he has facts like doctor reports lab results or whatever kind of proof he comes up with the truth of God will cause any seen thing the truth of God will cause any facts or reports to change if we won't back off of his report always agree with God and violently demand the promise do not be moved by facts and doctor reports or any other evidence that may be produced we want to make the temporary seen facts realign to the eternal truths of God which are in your bank account so that you receive your inheritance in this present life. Amen? Okay, so that's what this teaching is all about. We want to agree with God, disagree with the devil, and cause our situation to turn, whatever situations we're facing, we want them to turn into our favor, into alignment with his will, but don't back off of what's in your bank. Okay, now I want to talk about framing your world on truth, not framing your world on facts and evil reports. Okay, what world are you framing? A world in agreement with the eternal truth of God's word? Or are you framing a world in agreement with Satan's evil will by, by agreeing with 
and being pushed around by temporary seen facts and evil reports. Okay, the devil, he will produce evidence. Like you may have symptoms, you may have a doctor report, a lab report, but all these things are facts. We always have to remember truth is permanent, but facts change every, every day. Uh, every second or minute or hour or day, facts are constantly changing, but truth is permanent. Okay, and so when we believe in truth, we can cause the facts to rearrange. If you agree with God's eternal truth, the facts will realign to it. If you agree with temporary evil facts or reports, then you will suffer or you will die, you know, depending what the situation is. So if you're agreeing with some sickness and diagnosis and the, um, the doctor's words that you, know, you have a month to live and you're going to die, if you agree with that, you'll surely receive it. But if you disagree with that and you fight for the truth, by his stripes you were healed, that's a truth, then the facts will rearrange and so that you get the benefit. Okay, so we, I know it's hard, but we can't let facts and reports push us around. We need to be steadfast on the truth. Those things that are in your bank account, be not movable from the things that are in your bank account. Be steadfast and immovable from everything that Jesus has done for you. Don't be talked out of it. Okay, in Hebrews chapter 11 it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. The worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So all the facts and all the physical things around us, they were created by the word of God. Okay, so a spirit, an invisible, an unseen thing, you know, so God is an unseen thing. Words are unseen things. So these invisible things, um, God, a spirit, and his words have produced the facts which we see around us, like the earth and our bodies and whatever else you know Satan also is a spirit and he also speaks words and he brings forth facts into the seen realm which of course are contradictory to to God's will okay so things which we see with our eyes they're produced by a spirit and they're produced by words the facts are things which are seen and they are brought forth by the spirit world the facts, like all the facts that we see around us, the facts are things which are seen and they are brought forth by the spirit world. Evil, bad facts are brought forth by the devil and of course good facts are brought forth by God. The root cause of all seen things, the root cause of all facts is the spiritual world. So what that means is if we want to change the facts, then we need to focus on the spiritual world, on the things which are unseen. That means we need to resist, reject, cast down the devil, his words, and his works. And we need to resist, reject, cast down the devil, his words, and his works. We must believe in the promises of God and the full salvation of Jesus Christ, and then we must speak confess and pray in agreement with this full salvation and we need to align our actions to this full salvation you know, and to his promises and then when we do so we will realign the facts to our father's goodwill okay so that's our objective don't bow down to whatever facts you see don't we don't want to bow down like like the 12 spies two believed in the promise from Yahweh and ten did not. Ten, their their belief in the promise was overruled by the things that they saw with their eyes, and they all died by the plague. Okay, so it didn't turn out good for them. So we need to make sure that we we believe in God's goodwill, we believe in his promises, we believe in full salvation, we believe in these truths above and beyond anything that we see with our eyes, above and beyond whatever the doctor or the lab report tells us. If we just stay steadfast and immovable on his good will and speak and act in alignment with that, then everything's going to rearrange so that the promise comes true. And then in 2 Corinthians 
4.18, it says, So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Okay, so we have to focus on the thing that's in your bank account. So we have to focus on um, what's in your bank account. So by his stripes you were healed. That's in the bank. It's a truth. It's permanent. Um, the doctor's report, it's temporary. You know, and it may be true. It may even be false. Um, but it's temporary. So if you focus on the unseen truth, by his stripes you were healed, and you don't deviate from that, and you see these temporary facts will rearrange to your favor. So number six, if we want victory, then we must focus on the unseen spiritual truth of God's promises and the full salvation of Jesus. If we focus on bad, evil, temporary facts, then our heart will be established in failure and we will receive it. The facts will align to whatever we believe, speak, and act according to. Okay, so if we're focused on the seen evil facts, you know, whatever the doctor said, the lab result, the sonogram, the MRI, the blood test, whatever, if we focus on that, then we're going to receive that. But if we'll shift our focus and focus on God's truth and then align our faith with that, then we're going to receive that. So what that means is we need to esteem God's word above the facts and what the experts say. We need to esteem God's word above the facts and what the experts say. And I'm not saying this is a piece of cake, but this is what we have to do. We need to quit claiming and confessing the evil report that you are sick or whatever bad news you've been given. We need to believe and claim and confess that we are healed by the stripes of Jesus or again, whatever other truth you're needing in a situation. We need to quit agreeing with the wisdom of the world, which is foolishness. And we need to quit framing our world according to whatever the doctor says or some other expert. Okay, we need to reject the words of the doctor if they disagree with God's good will. We need to accept the words of God and then we can live in health, we can have victory, we can have provision, we can have protection or whatever other topic is relevant for a situation. All right, and we know from many different passages in the Bible that whatever we're believing in our heart and speaking out of our mouth is going to come true. Whether we're speaking uh, life, we'll receive life, or if we're speaking death, we're going to receive death. So our words are containers of power. Now, every time we open our mouth, we're releasing either the power of the devil or we're, we're releasing the power of God. So words are containers of power. All the words we speak contain either God's power of life, healing, victory, blessing, protection, etc. Or the words we speak that contain the devil's power of sickness, defeat, curse, failure, or any other bad thing. And life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And then in James, the Holy Spirit says that the tongue pollutes the whole body. The tongue sets the course of life on fire and is set on fire by hell. And so James was using some really strong language here, but the key thing here is if we misuse our tongue, if we're constantly agreeing with whatever the doctor's saying, these facts and lab results, if we're agreeing that and speaking that and agreeing with it and telling everybody we know, what are we doing? We're setting the course of our life on fire. So we need to stop proclaiming the devil's will. We need to stop rehearsing the bad news that the doctor or whoever said. Um, we can say, you know, the doctor said this, but I say, by his stripes I am healed, I shall walk in health, I have victory in this. You know, so we have to make whatever bad news, we have to make it the grasshopper, and then we have to make God's truth the giant. Because if we do it the other way around, then there's, there's imminent failure. Here's a picture. Okay, so basically, uh, let's just say we're talking about health. Okay, and we're looking at agreeing or disagreeing with God, and we'll look at some scenarios. So 100% health would be you're just walking in perfect health, and then 0% health would be you're dead, right? Okay, so the best place to be, obviously, is if you believe in God's truth and you're walking in it perfectly, then you can just abide in health all the days of your life, not getting sick, not, um, not experiencing any downturn in health. We are entitled to that. Jesus paid for that. He bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains, and by his stripes we were healed. 
Okay, so we are entitled to walk in 100% health all the days of our life. From the moment we can believe this, we can walk in that. All right. Now, I have um, two other people here. We have somebody, maybe they're arising in faith. They're the blue line. And then we have somebody who disagrees with what Jesus has done. And this could be somebody that's an unbeliever, which obviously they would fall in that category. Or this could even be a majority of Christians who don't really believe in what Jesus has done. So it doesn't matter whether they are born again or not born again, but if you disagree with what Jesus did for healing, you're the red line. Um, maybe somebody who's arising in faith is the blue line, and somebody who's perfect in God's good will would be the green line. Okay, and so what happens is maybe your two people here, okay, we have the perfect person, so we'll say that's us, right? We're the green line, and we're just not going to get sick, and we need to just make our mind up on that. Okay, but then we have two other people, um, the, the blue person and the red person, and the blue person's agreeing with God. They're they're pretty much they're doing pretty good, walking around 90% health, so they're doing pretty good. And then you know maybe some symptoms arise. Okay, so some symptoms come up. They start to get sick, and so they have a little downturn. So they drop down from 90% health down to maybe 70% health. Okay, and then what happens is right here, um, maybe, maybe they stay sick for a little while, and then. In month four, the doctor gives them a report. So the lab report came back, and they got some bad news. Now, you can react to that bad news in different ways. You can, you can reject and cast down that bad news, and you can proclaim, confess, and act in agreement with the promises of God, and then your health will be restored. That would be the blue line. Or you can believe in the bad report, and... You know, things will get worse, maybe you'll die due to the sickness, um, or even from a false report, people die from false reports even. And I'll give you an example of that. Okay, so one person, when they got the bad news from the doctor, they started confessing and acting in agreement with the promises of God, their health was restored. The other person got the bad news, they agreed with it, and they declined, and maybe they even died. Okay, and that could be a Christian or a non-Christian, but it's just somebody who doesn't stand steadfast in the stripes of Jesus. Now sometimes a person will get an evil report and it's just it's just wrong. It's just false. And but yet they still believe that they have something and they end up dying. And an example is Curry Blake was telling about uh, a lady who was diagnosed with breast cancer. Okay, so she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She was terrified of it and they prayed for her and they believed that the cancer was gone okay and and the indications were that it was gone but this lady was so filled with fear that she believed that she had cancer still and she died and they ended up doing an autopsy on her and when they did the autopsy they found there was no cancer in her body whatsoever she did not have cancer the cancer was gone after they prayed the cancer was gone so what she died from is she she died from faith she had faith in the evil report, and she received it even though there was no cancer in her body. So by faith in an evil report, she died. Okay, so whether or not a whether or not an evil report is true or false, if somebody's believing in a bad report, th that's faith. Whether there are facts, whether she factually had cancer and she believed in that and she died, or whether it was a false report and there was no cancer, if you have faith in some evil report, you will receive whatever you have your faith set on. Okay? So we want to be the green line. We want to be steadfast, and by his stripes we were healed. Um, you could make this access something else. It could be provision, protection, any other thing, right? But we want to just disagree with any evil report. You know, if symptoms come, we want to reject them, cast them down, proclaim our health. So we want to just be busy believing, confessing, and constantly acting in agreement with the promises of God. Amen? Okay, so now I want to go through some examples. And I'll go through some good examples, and I'll go through some bad examples. And so we're going to, you know, we're talking about agreeing with God, disagreeing with the devil. Okay, so that here's an example of agreeing with God, um, on all points in belief and speech and in action. Okay, so this is a, a little kitten that I had. Um, his name is Oliver. So on August first, uh, on August twenty fifth, twenty thirteen, I found Oliver the kitten in my backyard. 
he was seemingly birth defective because he was walking on three legs and his front left leg was withered and the back left leg was also weak. Okay, so basically he's dragging his front left leg on the ground and he's running or hobbling on the other three. Um, so it wasn't a good situation. And so what I did is I took him to the vet and then two doctors took a look at him and both doctors said that he had an incurable neurological disorder and that caused the left front limb to be withered and they also said that his back left leg uh, was also uh, withering. It was in the same process of, of more or less dying neurologically. Uh, and so he was going to lose function of that left back leg according to what the doctors were saying. And they said that the best thing to do was to amputate the front left leg that he was dragging on the ground. And they said, well, but the problem is that that left back leg is going out also and you can't amputate two legs because then what's the cat going to do? <laughs> you know, there's nothing he could do. And then they also said that he had a, a fever and he had a really bad infection. And so what they did is they prescribed some antibiotics and they sent me home basically with the decision whether I was going to amputate the leg or put him to death. You know, I had something to think about because they gave a doomsday report. All right, so what did I do in this situation? So as the vet was telling me the facts, as they were telling me the bad report, and in my mind, I was casting it down. Like, in the name of Jesus, I will not amputate his leg. In the name of Jesus, he will be healed. In the name of Jesus, he does not have an incurable condition. So all the while, like as, as long as their mouth is moving, I'm casting down in my head. Okay, they say more bad news, I'm casting it down in my head. So everything they're saying to me, as they're speaking it to me, I'm rejecting it. I'm not entertaining it. Okay? We don't want to entertain it because once we start thinking about it and meditating upon it, you know, remember their words are seeds and their words have power. We don't want the seed to be planted. We want to uproot it immediately. Okay, just like the devil comes, like Jesus was giving the example of the sower who sows the seed and the fowls of the air, they come and get the seed off the ground immediately. And he said that's the devil coming to steal the word which was sown. Okay, well, in the same way that the devil comes to steal the word of God which is sown so that it doesn't take root, we need to do the same thing. We need to immediately cast out those seeds that the devil's trying to plant so they don't take root. We don't want his seeds taking root in us. So when we start meditating upon what the doctor's saying, meditating upon the facts, daydreaming about it, envisioning surgeries, envisioning amputation, envisioning, envisioning putting him to sleep, what are you doing? You're like... You're putting dirt on the seed, you're watering it, you're fertilizing it, and it's going to grow up into the bad report that was spoken. Okay, But in the same way the devil can steal the word of God and make it of no effect, we need to cast out the word of the devil so it's of no effect in our life. Okay, Then, then I took him home and I made a decision. I chose not to give him the antibiotics. Okay, so here's what I was thinking. I was thinking, you know, I know that antibiotics work, so I was very tempted to give him antibiotics because he had a, a sickness and I had other cats in the house. I didn't want them to get sick. So according to worldly wisdom, you give antibiotics, they work really good, and that would cure that condition. Okay, so I was tempted to give the antibiotics, but yet they spoke this thing about an incurable neurological disorder, and that would definitely require faith to get victory in that situation. So I would be double-minded if I was trying to deal with one problem, the infection, the world's way, with antibiotics, and deal with the other condition, the neurological disorder, um, which is incurable by man, uh, and try and deal with that by faith. So I'd be double-minded, and I'd, be, I'd just be a walking contradiction. So I had to make the decision. I chose not to give the antibiotics because I had to either do this thing by faith or do this by the world. If I do it by the world, it's antibiotics and amputation. If I do it by faith, it's no antibiotics and it's no amputation. Okay, and that was the decision I made. And then I laid hands on him. I commanded the devil and his sickness to get out of his body. I commanded him to be healed, his leg to be restored. Um, I commanded walking and running to be restored. I commanded the infection to go. And then within one week, he was running around on all four legs just like a normal kitten. And he was also free from infection. Okay, so I got victory in this situation. Okay, and what we've been talking about is we need to do these three things. We need to believe right, speak right, and act right. There's three things. And that's what I put into practice. I was agreeing with God. I believed in his goodwill. You know, God's goodwill is that he says that 
you know, a good person loves his animal and cares for the welfare of his animal. Um, God said to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. He didn't say lay hands on sick people. He said sick. He didn't specify. He didn't rule out any creature. All creatures are included. He's also told us that we are to set creation free from the bondage of corruption. Okay, so God's good will is that nothing should be sick. Okay, so I believed in his good will. I believed in laying hands upon the sick so that they will recover. I believe in resisting the devil and making him flee, so I believed. Okay, then I rejected the evil report. All the while the doctor's speaking, I'm casting down everything they're saying. I'm rejecting it all. I'm not allowing it to be planted in me. Okay, and then I acted in agreement by making a decision not to give the antibiotics. I took an action. I, I acted in agreement with faith, what I said I was believing in, by not being double-minded and giving a dose of the worldly wisdom while at the same time kind of praying and hoping that that would work. I just did it all by faith. So my beliefs, my words, and my actions were all lined up, and we got victory, and little Oliver was healed. Okay, so that's a good example. Okay, now let's look at some bad examples. And I want to sandwich, I want to sandwich some bad ones in the middle of some good ones, okay? Because I don't want to end up on bad examples. Okay, so fear feeding frenzy. Okay, now here's a, a later time with little Oliver. So Oliver the kitten was struck with sickness when I left on a business trip in December of 2013. He was just profusely vomiting and more vomit and more vomit. And his caretaker was freaking out, and she kept calling me. She was sending me a million text messages. She was sending me pictures of vomit. She was continually declaring how sick he was, how terrible it was. And, um, you know, so what's happening is that the person who was caring for him was making the situation into a giant. And I was receiving this overflow of messages, this over, overflow of pictures of vomit. And... And that's warring against my faith because it's just an inundation of failure was coming upon me. And I tried to shut this person up because they kept speaking doubt and anti-faith. They were speaking death. They were proclaiming sickness and death. And I was praying for Oliver, but my faith was hindered. And fear came in because of the evil report and all this evidence that this person kept putting on me. I mean, it was like text message after text message after phone call after phone call. I couldn't even like sit in, in the meeting that I was in. I had to leave the room multiple times because of this overflow of messages was coming, and it was a, a huge distraction. And um, and that put fear in me, you know, because it was it was just relentless inundation of how bad it is, with pictures and and words and more pictures and more words. Okay, uh, so that that rocked my faith. And then a work of faith was done in the wrong direction, so against my will, the little kitten was taken to the vet, and immediately when she put him in the car and drove off to the vet, there was an immediate sharp downturn in his condition. And that's because it was a work of faith in a negative direction, in contradiction with what I was uh, trying to believe for. And anyway, so he ended up dying. And the moral of the story here is that Fear developed from all the evil reports that um, that were constantly flowing towards me. You know, it was like really hard to believe in this situation because of the inundation of pictures and messages, and that just overruled whatever faith I may have had. And it's kind of the same thing as the ten spies, when they, you know, there was twelve spies and two came back speaking victory and ten came back speaking death, and all those hundreds of thousands of people. They heard those ten spies and they believed everything they said and they were just filled with fear. You know, they're like, oh, we should have died in Egypt. Oh, why did God bring us out of Egypt only for us to die um, you know, out here and, and for our wives and children to suffer? And, and it was just, it was a fear feeding frenzy because of what these ten spies were pouring forth upon the people. Their evil report rocked the faith of hundreds of thousands of people and none of them got to experience the promised land. Okay? So that was a terrible situation. Well, the same thing happened here. I was moved out of a position of faith because of the inundation of evil reports being poured upon me, and therefore we did not receive the good thing and poor little kitten died. Okay, so we need to be careful. Like if we're somebody who's in need of prayer or we have a situation we're asking others to pray for, do not overflow them with how terrible it is. Do not overflow them with all the every grim detail that the doctor's saying, because what you're going to do is you're going to destroy their faith, and they're not going to be able to help you. 
So whether this is us dealing with our own situation or us asking for help, you, you, you can't take in all this inundation of evil report. Don't subject yourself to it. As much as possible, separate yourself from an inundation of evil reports. Now, I don't go to doctors because I don't want them to have the opportunity to speak into my life. You know, the devil will use them to speak something bad into my life, and then I may be inclined to believe it. So I just rather avoid that opportunity altogether. I don't want the devil to have chances to speak into my life. You know, the less fighting against his words I have to do by separating myself from them, then that's better for me. Okay? Uh, here's another bad example. Okay, so this one is an example of contradictory actions. Okay, there was a lady that was on her deathbed with cancer, and she was being prayed for. The family, I mean, they, they were Christians, and they, they professed to be believing in healing, and this family had also seen healing miracles in the past. Okay, so they were no stranger to healing. Um, and they were professing to be believing in her healing, yet their actions were in contradiction. They invited a priest over to their house, and the family was meeting downstairs, and they're picking out funeral songs while I was upstairs with the sick person. Okay, so their declaration of faith was betrayed and contradicted by their actions. You know, you can't say you're believing in healing and be picking funeral songs. It's a lie. You're not believing in healing if you're picking funeral songs. One is an absolute contradiction of the other. Okay, so their statement of faith, what, what, what they profess with their mouth, was contradicted by their action of picking out funeral songs. And their wife and their mom died, unfortunately. And then afterwards, they're wondering why she wasn't healed. But we were in faith. We were believing for healing. No, you weren't. You were not believing in healing. If you were believing in healing, you wouldn't have invite the priest over to pick out funeral songs. And so we have to be careful because you know, worldly wisdom will come and worldly wisdom will say, well, you know, you need to face the facts. We need to be realistic about it. They're not going to recover. We need to be realistic. Go ahead and plan the funeral. Do this. Pick the songs out. And, and you know, I'm not saying it's easy to overcome what we see with our eyes. But if we want supernatural results, we have to do that. And we need to make sure our actions do not betray our profession of faith. Because then we're, we're very, extremely unlikely to receive. Okay? And here's another bad example. There was a lady who was just magnifying the problem, just blowing it, blowing it up into a huge giant. And this lady, she had a severe tormenting pain, and she reached out for prayer. Okay, so you know she reached out to me for prayer, and then we're we're talking on the phone, and then I said, okay, well, you know, you're going to be healed by the stripes of Jesus. Your healing's paid for. And she started laughing at me. And then I heard her say in the background, this guy thinks he's going to heal me. You know, like, I guess she didn't think I could hear that. So she's scorning me, thinking it's a joke that I think that she can be healed. I mean, so um, so then she went on to say for like, I don't know, 30 minutes or an hour, she was just going on and on and on, telling me how terrible it was, how bad the pain was, how she can't do this anymore, she can't do that anymore, how many years she'd been affected, how she'd had a bazillion people pray for her and nothing ever happened. Um, but she said, but I don't understand why I believe in healing scriptures. And then she'd go on telling me more and more how terrible it was. And so by the time she's like done all this, you know, there wasn't like a shred of faith anywhere in me. <laughs> I mean, she just destroyed any, any shred of faith I might have had, any mustard seed I might have had was destroyed by her going on for 30 minutes or an hour and telling me how bad things were. So it's super important. You can't be telling a big, long failure testimony. You can't be magnifying how bad it is. You can't be. You can't magnify your situation to the point that yourself and the people you ask to pray for you uh, are no longer in faith. You know, just be short and sweet. This is this is the diagnosis. This is the symptom I'm having. Pray for me. You know, short and sweet. Forget all the detail because it's it's not going to help. It's going to hurt. And there's many examples like this. Okay, so don't magnify the problem, magnify the truth. Okay, now let's look at some good testimonies. Okay, agreeing with God, good testimonies. Okay, so rejecting the facts. Okay, there's a sister, and she received a diagnosis of aneurysm in the carotid artery on the basis of an imaging test. And I don't remember if it was an MRI, a CAT scan, or whatever it was, 
But I mean, it was a pretty high competence test that said she's got this big, huge bubble on her carotid artery, and if that blows out, then you're going to die. You're just going to bleed to death internally. Now, that carotid artery is that major, major artery. And she was prayed for in agreement, actually by us on this team right here. She was prayed for in agreement, and we cast it down and rejected the diagnosis. Remember, that was a, they had facts. The, they had facts. There was an imaging test that was done. There's a big balloon about to burst on her carotid artery. That's a fact. There was a picture. Okay? But we rejected the facts. We rejected the diagnosis. We rejected the picture. And she, we declared her to be healed by the stripes of Jesus. And then, uh, I don't know, a week or two later when she went back for a follow-up exam to plan surgery, the aneurysm was gone, and they tried to call it a misdiagnosis. Okay, It wasn't a misdiagnosis. It's that we believed in truth. We rejected the evil report, and the facts rearranged to the truth. By his stripes, this lady was healed. Amen? And that was us. We prayed for her. This group of people on our little WhatsApp message um, messenger. Okay, so we don't bow down to the facts. We make the facts change to be in our favor. Okay, and another example of casting down. There was a man in Norway, and he received a high confidence diagnosis of stomach cancer, and he and his fa family were both convinced. And what we did with him is we reviewed scriptures about, you know, about healing and by his stripes you were healed. But then we also looked at scriptures about casting down. And then what we did is we rejected the diagnosis, just like we did with this lady up here. We rejected the diagnosis, and he did have symptoms in the stomach, so we prayed for the stomach to be healed. But, you know, we want to reject the, the idea of cancer. We, we do not ever want to accept a, a cancer diagnosis. Um, you'd rather it be heartburn or, or whatever, you know, ulcer than cancer, right? So you want to reject that, that evil report of cancer. Um, he did have symptoms, so we did also pray for healing in addition to casting down. And um, then what happened is he got sicker for a period, and then he got better, and then he had a follow-up doctor visit, and they did some, you know, um, high-quality imaging tests, and I think they ran a scope down his into his stomach, also, and basically they reversed the diagnosis, and they said he absolutely did not have cancer, and it was some minor irritation in the stomach or something like that. So it was a very minor thing. But it, it would have been cancer if we hadn't rejected what the doctor was saying. Okay, so we have to reject that diagnosis. Remember, every time you get a, a diagnosis, that's the devil. He's planting seeds. It could be true seeds or it could be false seeds. But if you believe in the seed, it doesn't matter whether there was really something there or not something there. Um, if you believe it, that's faith, and you're going to get it. All right. Another example, um, declaring an agreement. Okay, and th this one, there was a man in California, and his daughter was diagnosed as being unable to get pregnant. And we prayed in agreement, casting down the evil report, and we declared that she would get pregnant. Um, we declared scriptures, like when you look in the Old Testament, there's promises that there will be no barren among you nor your animals. There will be no casting um, of the child. In other words, there will be no, um, what's the word for that? Uh, miscarriage. So there will be no barren among you. There will be no miscarriage. And then there's also um, the goodwill of God is stated in that you know, children are referred to as having a quiver full of arrows. You know, so God wants us to have. You know, if you want a quiver full of arrows, you're entitled to have a quiver full of arrows. In other words, as many children as you would like. So that is God's goodwill on the subject of pregnancy. So we declared on the basis of those scriptures that she would get pregnant and she would bring forth a kid. And we declared that she was healed by the stripes of Jesus. We declared that her female organs were properly functional and so forth. And the result of that is the world's wisdom was made foolish and she became pregnant without issue. Amen? And we've got a million of these. Um, I'll do two more, <laughs> but we have a bazillion examples. Now here's an example of acting in agreement. And we've looked at examples of believing and speaking in agreement. Now here's an example of acting in agreement. And we have a friend in India, and she was pregnant. And then during the course of her pregnancy, she was diagnosed as having diabetes and high blood sugar. And they prescribed her medicine. 
and she was told that her baby and her pregnancy were at risk. Okay, so the devil's speaking death into her life. He's trying to, uh, he's trying to destroy her health, and he's also trying to destroy the baby. Okay, by speaking these words and by having this disorder. And so what we did is we rejected the diagnosis. We also prayed for her blood sugar to be restored, her insulin to be restored. We declared that you know her baby would go to full term without issue. Okay, so we were we were praying and casting down, rejecting what the doctor said, and things were somewhat better after we did that. Like her blood sugar, it kind of bounced up and down. And she was still taking medicine for it, so it was somewhat better. But we were not where we needed to be. And then what happened was some work event came up and in this work event she somehow was not able to take her medicine and she also she had to eat like bad food you know if you're a diabetic there's certain types of food that are just bad for you which will cause your blood sugar to blow up and so she didn't have her medicine and she had to eat bad food um, that would normally spike your blood sugar and so what happened is this ended up being a work of faith in agreement with by his stripes you were healed so she made the decision to go ahead and eat despite not having her medicine and despite the fact that this was so-called bad food so she did a work of faith trusting in God that that um, this would not you know cause a problem for her and what should have happened worldly speaking is her blood sugar should have been through the roof but instead what happened is she was immediately experienced a full manifestation of healing and her blood sugar was perfect below a hundred okay so she did a work of faith in agreement with the truth by his stripes you were healed and that resulted in her complete healing in that moment so that's an example of an action acting in agreement with what you say you're believing in bringing forth the desired result okay and then another one so disagreeing with the facts and there was a man in Costa Rica and he had a minor procedure done at the hospital and then Satan struck him with symptoms of cardiovascular disease and the doctors gave him an evil uh, an evil report they said he had cardiac failure it was a doomsday report so it was bad and what we did is me and the daughter we rejected the report and the next day he was <laughs> he was perfectly well and the daughter took a picture of of her dad in the car on the way home from the hospital perfectly healed the condition this the symptoms of cardiovascular disease were completely gone and the doctors recanted their report and said it was a normal reaction well that's 180 degrees different than what they said the day before okay and it's because we did not accept what the devil was saying okay we rejected we uprooted the seeds the devil was trying to plant the devil was trying to plant seeds of us believing in cardiovascular disease and death and destruction we uprooted the seed by casting it down and then sure enough it, the symptoms went away and the doctors recanted their report amen and so all these things are examples of agreeing with God and disagreeing with the contradictory evidence facts reports diagnosis whatever we need to agree with God and we need to disagree with everything the devil's saying and the facts he's producing the symptoms he's producing don't accept these things be adamant about your bank statement amen okay I, I could have pages and pages so here's another page if you want to take a screenshot you can take a look at that um, but the conclusion of this entire agree with God teaching is this we need to believe correctly we need to believe in full salvation we need to believe in the promises of God that are in your bank account believe in the sufferings of Jesus that are in your bank account believe in the full salvation of Jesus which is in your bank account and we need to believe that um, testimonies will help accurate Bible study will help in your mind be replaying victories be sharing them with other people put your faith into practice and get victories and then when you do those things your believing will be perfected and that's what we need okay then we need to constantly be speaking our faith be speaking in agreement with what we say we believe in and so we need to read scripture um, read it out loud confess it out loud we need to pray according to God's goodwill we need to avoid contradictory speech which the devil will try and trap us in 
because he'll get people to ask us questions, to reconfess symptoms, reconfess diagnoses, reconfess failure. He'll try and he'll try and pull us into conversation, like worldly conversation. People will brag about how hard a project's going to be and how difficult it's going to be, and this and that. It's going to take forever. Whatever kinds of normal failure-minded conversation happen, he'll try and pull you into that. But we need to be rejecting those things and make sure that we don't casually be agreeing and speaking those same failure-minded things because that's normal conversation and we must not enter into that okay we need to cast down all contradictions so we need our speech to align with the things that we say we believe in and when we hear things that contradict we need to cast them down okay and then we need our actions to line up with what we what we're speaking and believing and we need to be just always just living in faith um, we need to act in agreement with God's goodwill like we saw Noah acted in agreement with what God had said to him even though for a hundred years he looked like a fool and surely people were saying all kinds of things about him talking about how crazy he is how stupid is he building a boat on dry land I mean so he looked like a fool for a hundred years um, but he he was saved because he did not waver okay we talked about Children are an excellent example of acting in agreement with something that's spoken to them. Okay, well, God has spoken his goodwill and promises to us in the Bible. Now we need our actions to align. And a good example would be when you tell a kid, hey, um, I'm going to take you to Disneyland tomorrow. I mean, they, they're going to believe the word that you have said to them. And then they're going to tell all their friends, my dad is taking me to Disneyland tomorrow. They're going to be packing their bag. They won't be able to sleep at night. They're going to be filled with excitement because they so believe in the word that was spoken to them and all of their actions are going to align to that to that promise that you spoke to them. In the same way, we need all of our actions to align with the promise promises that God has spoken to us. And a major thing is we need to avoid double-minded actions. And we looked at some examples today like the funeral songs, like um, this family, they were picking funeral songs while they're saying they're believing in healing and they wondered why their loved one passed. Um, you know, if we say we're believing in God, then we shouldn't. Well, anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, we also need to avoid backup plans. You know, a backup plan is, is an open door for faith to go out. If you have a backup plan, then you're not, then you're not in faith. If you have a backup plan, then that means that you have a doubt that your faith is going to work. That means you're not really in faith. Maybe a little bit, maybe. Hopefully you have a mustard seed. But generally speaking, if you're planning a backup plan, then then you're planning that your faith is not going to work. Okay, that's not faith. All right? So I think that wraps it up.